Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, free cell phone. Oh. I'll give you $5 for it. Okay. Anyone for 10? 10? 10 going once? Oh, 11. I heard 11. Okay. Oh, my. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody here. Um, familiar faces and some new faces. Now, I'm just going to talk real quickly to people who are at home. You're probably sitting in your living room, and uh, you might even be laying down on the couch. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to just look in the camera and tell you, you need to sit up straight. Uh, and you need to really uh, just think of yourself as being at church. You're, you're in your home, but you're, you're at church. Uh, church. So I've been making some visits into people's homes, and uh, um, people are eager to to return. And uh, so I look forward to to seeing more and more families returning. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna we're gonna have some announcements um, with respect to reopening and how we're gonna reopen certain uh, elements of our. S- service, child care, and Sunday school for kids, and things like that. So we hope to be able to make some clear um, uh, announcements with some precise dates in the coming weeks. So we look, we look forward to that. Um, I miss a lot of things about what, what we had that we don't have now. One of the things I miss uh, a lot is the, the laughter and the, just the the kids' voices in the hallways. I really miss that. So, listen, if, you, uh, if you're not going to bring your kids, then send me, uh, send me a recording of your kids uh, giggling and laughing, and uh, we'll just pipe that into the hallways. <laughs> so we are in our series. This is our third week in Deuteronomy on the family series. Uh, it's an eight-week series, uh, so we'll go through this month and, and all of next month. We're studying what is called the Shema, which means to hear and to respond. Uh, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it's where Moses is, is kind of his last challenge to, his, uh, to God's people. He challenges God's people to love God with all their heart soul, and might. We learned in verse 1 two weeks ago that this is a command that comes directly from God. Even though Moses is writing it, it's not a suggestion by Moses. It is a command from God. We learned in verse 2 last week that it all begins with a healthy fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of of wisdom. We learned that when you fear God, you have nothing else to fear. And that there are three basic definitions for fear, uh, the word fear in the Old Testament. One is to fear God's wrath, and we should have a healthy fear of God's wrath. And it's also to be in awe or to be astonished by Him and who He is. And then third, to have a reverence and an honor for Him, to to respect. So, today we're going to look at verse 3 on the subject of obedience. And all God's people said, Ugh. I've titled today's message, To Hear and to Do. Now, we've done this the last two weeks, and uh, we're going to do it this morning. We're going to read the entire passage, verses 1 through 9, and then we will dig in. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, 
which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your father, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as sign, as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So now we're in verse 3, and you see right away that it begins with, Hear therefore. Now, I was told by a seminary professor that whenever you see the word therefore, you need to know what it's there for. Yeah. So you have to take, say, because they say, therefore, you got to read before what it says, and then it's tied to what comes directly afterwards. So to summarize verses 1 and 2, we get that God's instruction is to obey His command, and that all the generations must fear the Lord, that is, the fear is wrath, be in all of Him, and to reverence Him, to have a reverence and a respect and an honor for Him. And then, therefore, now hear this, listen, God's people. Verse 3, right off the bat, you, you have two imperatives, two commands, two verbs. One is to hear, and the other is to do. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord the God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, marketing experts will tell you that it takes seven times for people to hear of a product before they will pull the trigger, before they will decide what they're going to do with it. Uh, some people will drive by restaurants uh, many times before they decide they're going to stop in and try it out. First, you drive by and you see how many cars are in the parking lot. That's a good sign. Here uh, in L.A., uh, you have the ratings, right? You never go to a sushi restaurant that has a D rating, right? Uh, have you ever eaten at any place that has a D rating? Anybody? Well, I have. I was hungry. It was a, it was a taco place. Okay. Now... But experts tell us that, that, you, that the marketing folks will tell you that you have to put your product in front of people. You have to get it in front of them seven times. It's an average of seven times before they decide that they're going to try your product. Now some of you parents will say that it takes a whole lot more than seven times for your kids to hear that you want them to clean their room. <laughs> In the case of marketing, the responsibility of, of getting the message to the potential buyer, that's on you. That's on you to get that information to them. But in this case, the responsibility to hear God's message is not on him to perhaps market it right or bundle it with other things so that it's attractive to you or to give you incentives to make so that you can make a decision. The responsibility to hear God's word and to act on God's word is on you. It's on me. It's on us. The word Shema for hear doesn't refer only to the act of hearing, but also refers to 
a response having heard. It can literally mean to take heed or to listen obediently. Now there's a concept that many, uh, many parents would love to implement in their homes, right? Listen obediently. <laughs> there's always one in the crowd. Now if that wasn't clear enough to use that verb, to listen obediently, Moses adds a second verb and he says to do his command. Not just hear them, but be careful to do them. We looked at this word before uh, in verse 1. Now in, the, in English it takes the verb, uh, the adverb careful to emphasize the verb to, to do. So it's a carefully do. But in the Hebrew, it's, it's one word. It's a single word that means to carefully do them. So it's not just, just nonchalantly and just do them, but it's to carefully take part in it. Some of your translations may, may use the word observe, to carefully observe. And that's a good word if we understand the true meaning of the word observe. It's not in the sense of observing something happening, but you're observing as in observing the Lord's Supper. When we observe the Lord's Supper, you're not just standing around watching it happen. You're participating in it. You take part in it. You put it all together, and it's clear that God holds His people responsible to listen obediently and to carefully do what he commands. Sir Leonard Wood once visited the king of France and the king was so pleased with him that he was invited for dinner the next day. Sir Leonard went to the palace and, and the king meeting him at one of the halls said, Why, Sir Leonard, I did not expect to see you. How is it that you are here? Did not your majesty invite me to dinner with you? Said the astonished guest. Yes, replied the king. But you did not answer my invitation. It was then that Sir Leonard Wood uttered one of the choicest sentences of his life. He replied, A king's invitation is never to be answered but to be obeyed. If man can subject himself to an earthly king, how much more deserving is God to be obeyed when he commands? I've said this before, and I think it's worth repeating. The problem is not that God has too many rules. The problem is we don't want to obey them. Andy, you will love this story. A father once told his pastor, I used to have problems getting my son to clean his room. I would insist that he do it now. And he would always agree to do so, but, when he, wouldn't, he, but he wouldn't follow through, at least not right away. After high school, he joined the Marine Corps, which is where he is now. When, when he and I were on the plane together coming home from his leave after boot camp, he said to me, my life makes sense now, Dad. Everything you said and did when I was growing up now makes sense. I really, really understand. And then he added, oh, yes, Dad. I learned what now means. <laughs> I think Marines would make very good Christians. What do you think, Michael? God never commands you to do something that has no benefit to you. 
Do you get that? When God calls you to obedience, it, it's not so, so that he can reward you, but there is always a reward that comes with obedience. It's true that we exist to glorify him, but it benefits us to heed his commands. Look in verse 3 again. It says that it may go well with you that you may multiply greatly. This word it may go well in the Hebrew is yatab. It, it is a, uh, it's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful word in that it, it, it talks about the goodness and the greatness and the fullness of God's blessing for you. It it parallels verse 2 when it says that your days may be long. Now this word, I looked this up, the word has 61 variations of meanings. That's kind of the Hebrew way, is that you have one word and it can mean so many variations, it has so many variations of meanings. And depending on the context... You would choose the right meaning. So in just in the NASB, it translates into 61 different meanings. I just pulled out the top five. Number five, it means thoroughly. That it may go thoroughly well with you. It's tied to the word prosper, and I don't, I don't, it doesn't necessarily mean monetary prosperity, but just prospering in your life. Number four, go well. Number three, be pleased. Number two, do good. And number one, be well. In any definition of the word, it's very clear that it is, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that it may go well with you. In this verse alone, there's, the blessings are twofold. First, it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly. Now Israel, God's people have multiplied, but not greatly. So does this mean that God hasn't kept His promise? No. Remember that God has a condition for His promise. Remember, God's condition is to do these things. So God's promises have always been for His people to be blessed as a result of their obedience. God's not going to bless you. God's not going to bless me if I am not living an obedient life. Many of you know Donna, she teaches preschool. Um, and I tell you, that, that's a, it's a wonderful profession, but it's, a, but it's a very challenging profession. And she comes home all the time and she tells me stories about, more of stories about parents uh, not knowing what to do. She sometimes has to have a conference with these parents regarding their children's bad behavior. So you can always tell a child who gets his or her way at home. By the way, that that is one of the greatest tragedies in American homes today where the parents are more concerned about being their child's friend than they are about being their child's authority. They're more interested in being liked by their kids and 
I've been in homes where kids get to call, they call the shots. And that's dangerous. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you in spoiling and loving all my kids and my grandkids. But you are doing a great disservice when you don't discipline your children and when you don't show them and when you don't teach them the right way. So, you can always tell these kids that have bad behavior in class, it's because they rule the roost at home. So what's Donna's answer to these struggling parents? The answer is to reward good behavior and stop rewarding bad behavior. You know where, they, you know where she gets that? She gets that, I mean, it's really common sense, but common sense gets it from the Bible. That's, that's what God does. That's how God works. He, he does not reward bad behavior, and neither should parents. It's always been God's design to attract other nations to Himself by blessing His own people in a unique way. But Israel's disobedience always circumvented that plan. It's not that God failed in fulfilling His promise, but His people failed in keeping theirs. And God is certainly not going to reward bad behavior. It was made clear to them of the abundant blessing awaiting them for following God and also the curse that awaited them for not following Him. But sadly, the history of Israel is one of disobedience. But when we point our fingers at them, there are fingers pointing back at us. What could people say about your history, your life. Is it one of obedience or is it of disobedience? And then we come to this milk and honey. What, what, what's this milk and honey all about? It's a land that is promised to God's people, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, this is a phrase that's used not just in uh, Hebrew uh, writings, in Hebrew history, but also it's a phrase that's used in other writings of that time, Egyptian and otherwise. And it was, it was how they described this land that was called Palestine, this land that was promised to God's people. You see it in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and here in Deuteronomy. And it, it often made reference to this land flowing with milk and honey. Now the, the phrase milk and honey is sort of, it's a hyperbole. It's hyperbolic way of describing the riches of the land of promise. We use hyperbole all the time, do we not? And so it's used here. We could say Luke was dying to get a new iPhone. <laughs> he wasn't literally dying, but it's a figure of speech. It was so hot that literally everyone was on fire. I mean, we've had some hot days, but were they, were they literally on fire? No. No. How about this? This box weighs a ton. Nobody I know can lift a ton. So, why milk and honey? Why use milk and honey? So, milk. Who likes milk? Everyone like milk? I love milk. All right. Um, there's certain milks I don't consider milk, but I love milk. I love whole milk. Um, 
And uh, but Donna's got me on. She she's tricked me down to two percent for about ten years, and then the last five years I've been down to one percent. And uh, you know, just one day I woke up and I'm like, this is kind of watery, and 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 then I realized that it's yeah, it's one percent. It's like, okay. But anyway, so I I came up with a list of eighteen types of milks. You realize that we have a lot of different kinds of milk, and um, so. Number one is goat milk. Not in any order, but goat milk, okay? Now, I like goat cheese, and I, I assume that goat cheese comes from goat milk, all right? Skin milk. This is the fat-free milk. Raw milk. Organic milk. Sweet and condensed milk. Now, <laughs> sweet and condensed milk. That's, I say yes to that. Uh, almond milk, no. yuck. <laughs> Whole milk, yes to that. Soy milk, I mean, I'm Asian, but mmm. Coconut milk, nope. Lactose-free milk, yeah, that, uh, that's good because uh, uh, that, that's good for one of my grandsons. Buffalo milk. I, I, buffalo milk, they say, has real high fat content. Now, I can just... I'm just trying to picture and trying to imagine how you, how you would milk a buffalo. Rice milk. Hemp milk. Hemp milk. Okay? Don't get any ideas, okay? Um, that's the kind of milk that probably makes you hungry and get the munchies afterwards, right? Flavored milk. Like chocolate milk and... You know, strawberry milk and all. Evaporated milk, oat milk, low fat milk, and then finally buttermilk. Now I love I love buttermilk biscuits, but I'm not a fan of buttermilk itself. But there are all kinds of different kinds of milk that we enjoy today. Now, for them, it was probably one or two. It was probably either goat milk or cow's milk sure the milk comes from cows goats or coconuts but it takes a lot of human labor to produce it okay so when you're thinking about milk and honey I want you to think about this that on the one hand milk yes it's the cows that produce it but it takes a lot of human labor to extract that milk okay so on one part with cow, it's human labor involved. Honey, on the other hand, is a product of nature. Who likes honey? You guys like honey? I love honey. Um, I, honey is, I put it on my toast and sometimes in my coffee. I, I, I love honey. Who doesn't like honey? It's like, no, I do not like honey. Anybody here? No? I imagine there's some people who do not like honey. I think there's probably more people who don't like honey than there are people who don't like milk. But honey was one of the few sources in their day. It was one of the few sources of ingredients when sweetness was desired. Honey was a luxury. It wasn't a necessity. Milk would have been a necessity, but honey was a luxury. You guys know Mercy Me, the, the band Mercy Me? Back when they were a, a bunch of young guys, they're a popular uh, Christian group. They used to sing a song called Holy and Anointed One. And part of the lyrics go like this. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. So after one of their sets at a conference, a teenage boy came up to them and said, I don't like that song. So the lead singer, Bart, he kind of sat down with them and he asked them, why don't you like that song? He said, because I don't like honey. And I, and I love Jesus and I, I, I don't like the idea of, of thinking of Jesus like there's honey on, on my lips. He said, well, if you don't like 
honey on your lips. What do you like, hun- uh, what do you like on your lips? So this boy thought about it for a second, and he said, barbecue sauce. <laughs> so in the evening session at the conference, they sang that song again, and they changed the words. So the entire audience, some six, 7,000 teenagers, instead of re, uh, singing, your name is like honey on my list, they sang, your name is like barbecue <laughs> on my lips. Milk coming from human labor and honey from nature. It represents the full measure of God's Blessing associated with God's promise. It's the it's the the vast expanse of how God wants to bless his people. Milk, necessity, and even honey, sweet. Not necessities, but enjoyments. I love that. that They used milk and honey to describe God's blessing. So milk and honey here was used as a metaphor for God's promise of an abundant life. And that's really what God is promised here is the abundant life. If they will only obey God, his commands. And that brings us back to what we started with. To hear and to do God's command. We do our best here at Mandarin Baptist Church to make sure that you have ample opportunities to hear God's commands. I try to be as faithful as I know how to preach the truth and preach the gospel and preach God's word from this platform. And we have capable Sunday school teachers and Bible study teachers of all grades who tirelessly study to bring the truth to you. But all of that cannot bring you to obedience. Obedience to God's Word does not come from how much you hear, but it comes from your heart, your decision to act on God's Word. That part is up to you. So in closing, choose today to obey God. And no matter how hard the decision might be to trust God with it. In your bulletin, uh, we have some questions. And I, I hope that you will take this home or later today, if you're watching a live stream, that later today you'll find a quiet corner and that you will go through and take the time to answer some of these questions. But... I really want to draw your attention to number six. And it says to write a list of commands you know for sure God is calling you to do. So just take a moment and just write what God is calling you to do. And then I want you to just, this is between you and God, okay? You're not going to turn this in and get it great. And none, you know, you don't show it to anybody. I want you to take and I, I want you to then circle the ones that you have no problems obeying. Just circle them. And then underline the ones that you struggle with. And then take number seven, pray for God to guide you to victory over the ones you struggle with and thank Him for the ones you already have victory. So I pray that you will do that exercise. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Father, we thank you that in this passage and other passages that you have called us to be doers of the word and not merely hearers. It's important, Lord, we understand to hear clearly what your word says, but it's altogether another thing for us to act upon it. And Lord, I thank you that in our church, in our midst, there are so many who are doers of the word. They take you seriously. They take your word seriously. And they live the best they know how according to your word. But Lord, we know that all of us, if we were to sit down and make a list of things, that there are some things that we struggle with. And yet we hear you loud and clearly that you call us to obedience. And Lord, I know that you, you do not call us to do something where you don't give us the strength and the ability to do it. And so, Lord, for those things that we, have, we will circle, the commands that you have commanded us to do, that we will circle, Lord, that we, we don't even struggle with them. We just do them, and we, we get so much joy from doing them. But that there's so many other things, Lord, that we struggle with, Lord, that we have to underline. Being a witness, loving our neighbor, loving our enemies. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Just there's so many things that, that each of us struggle with. I pray, Lord, that you give us victory over those struggles so that there are no longer struggles. That we can change them from underlining to circling. And Lord, we thank you that we know that this is a process. That the sanctification process, it's, it's grueling and it's lifelong. And that there's always things that you want us to work on. There's always things that you want us to, to turn over to you and to surrender to you. And to walk in obedience of your word. Give us courage, Lord, to do that. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, we're